Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech and in this tutorial I'm going to be showing you how to prep your surfaces for recording triangle forces and triangle wear. So if I go over to one of my belts and let's generate a belt. I've already turned off my drop box. You can see that the belt is composed of triangles and in a simulation Newton records the triangle force and the triangle wear on a per triangle basis. So for each triangle in each frame of the playback file there's going to be an associated wear value and force value and in order to save that data first thing you should do is go and set your save triangle force and work data to yes otherwise Newton will not record those those forces and wear data and you might say well why don't I just always set this to yes and that's because it's not always necessary to record the force and wear data if you're not interested in it then don't bother recording it because all it's going to do is make the simulation take a little bit longer and it's also going to make your output file size bigger and depending on the number of triangles it could make your file size 10 percent bigger or it could make your file size 20 times bigger so there are two types of work that Newton records the impact and the abrasive work the impact work is the work that is normal to the surface. When a particle impacts a surface and begins pushing into that surface, that's your impact work. The abrasive work is the friction work, the sliding work, as the particle slides tangentially to the surface of the triangle. Now when recording forces, Newton records two types of forces. There's the parallel force and the perpendicular force. The parallel force is the force that is parallel to the direction of the velocity vector for your triangle. So if we give this belt a velocity, say 2.5 meters per second, now we can see that all these vectors are pointing along the belt. So if I was to record the, the forces on here, my parallel force, if I had a positive parallel force, it would be acting along the triangle in the direction of that vector. So the parallel force, both the parallel and the perpendicular forces are tangential to the surface of the triangle. So they're, they're associated with that, um, with that abra abrasive work. It's the, the force that, that pushes, tries to push that triangle along in the direction of the velocity. So a negative parallel force would be opposing the velocity of the belt. So if I had, if this was a receiving belt underneath a discharge point, as the material, if it's coming straight down onto the belt, it's going to be exerting a lot of negative forces on that belt, because the belt is trying to do work to pull that material forward. Now, the parallel force is pretty straightforward in that it's either along the vector or against the vector. But the perpendicular force is a little bit more complicated, because perpendicular, we're talking about left or right but how exactly do we determine what is left and what is right, which is positive and which is negative? And the answer is we use the normal vector of the triangle. So if I right click and I say triangle normal vectors, this will show a magenta vector at the center of gravity of each triangle. And that vector is pointing identical to the, the uh, normal vector of the triangle. And you can see that with this, with the, the belts that you generate in Newton, those vectors are always pointing upward and inward toward the center of gravity of that belt. Now if I also turn on my velocity vectors, you can see that each triangle now it has a velocity vector and a normal vector. And when we talk about our perpendicular force, we, what we do is we cross the normal vector, the, sorry, the velocity vector with the normal vector. So following the right-hand rule, if I take A cross B, my C vector, my resulting vector, points perpendicular to the right if I'm looking at this from above. So if I cross the, my forward vector with my vector coming upward, my thumb points to the right. So that's the positive direction for our perpendicular force. So when I'm looking at a plot of the forces, any of, any of the red forces, the higher positive forces, are pushing the belt to the right. And any of the blue or negative forces are pushing the belt to the left. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. 
but the idea here is that when you record your forces you need to make sure if you import your own belt you need to make sure that those normal vectors are shaped exactly like this or if you want the normal vectors could all be pointing exactly opposite so these could all be pointing downward then it's simply reversed so your positive force would point to the to the left rather than the right but since the belts are generated this way in Newton it would just make most the most sense to to import your belts the same way so let's go ahead and delete this belt actually you know what let's just go ahead and open up another file I'll turn off my vectors first turn that off turn that off so if I open up this file here alright I've got some surfaces in here I've got feed belt I've got some shoot geometry a receive belt and a hood So you can see that I've already meshed up these surfaces a little bit, but why don't we go ahead and just re-import that geometry. Okay, so this is what we started with before. Now, let's say that I want to record the, the wear on this receiving belt. Well, the first thing to do is to either, well, you could either check the normal vector or you can assign your velocity. Actually, I guess it makes most sense to check that normal vector first because we imported each of these on separate layers, right? And what Newton does when it imports each layer, it finds the center of gravity of that layer and it tries to point all the normal vectors for all the triangles toward that center. So this means that any time you import a belt, if it's a simple belt like this with three or five faces then it, and it's curved upward, it's always going to point those normal vectors inward and upward toward the center of gravity. If I go back to wireframe view, turn on my normal vectors. Well, you know what, why don't we just go ahead and mesh that up so we can see a few more vectors. My receive belt, equalize, divide. Okay, now it's easy to see. You can see that every triangle points, every normal vector points inward and upward. And that's identical to this feed belt. They're all pointing inward and upward. So when you're importing your geometry and you want to check you, and you want to record those forces on a belt, as long as you draw your belt in a simple in a simple way like this, so that you know it's just three faces, the center of gravity will be right here, and all the normal vectors will be pointing in the proper direction. You just want to make sure that you turn these on and check that. So what about? what about this hood here there's two things we want to be checking on this hood we know uh, for, for this simulation I'll show you in a bit this simulation is going to involve rotating this hood and I've mentioned in previous tutorials that whenever you have rotation you want to make sure that your surface is, is pretty well meshed up so that you have a good velocity gradient across that rotating surface now you can see that based on the position of this bar this, this hood is only going to rotate you know in this direction and what that means is that the velocity of all these triangles is going to be identical in the x direction. The velocities will be identical across the face of the hood. So if I, if I wanted to, I could look at this and say, well, I've already got 16 divisions in this uh, yz plane. So I think this is probably sufficient to record the, the proper velocity gradient. I probably wouldn't need to mesh, mesh this up anymore just for doing rotation. But I want to record the, I want to record the wear on that hood as well. So the best way to do that is to use our buttons down here that I've showed you before. You, you would go to your, I've, I've put the deflector and the f deflector bar and the sides all on separate layers. So if I go ahead here and uh, for the sake of simplicity let's go ahead and delete this belt and let's delete the top of the, sh the, top of the chute. Okay. So you can see that I've got three separate layers here. I've got the bar the deflector and the sides because if I want to mesh these up I want to mesh them all up separately I don't want to mesh up this bar when I don't even need to I just want to mesh up this front face so if I go back to my wireframe mode and I go to my deflector first you always use the equalize triangles button because what this does is it looks for these long narrow triangles and tries to subdivide them and only after you subdivide them, if I click it, you square them up. Now you want to divide the triangles. You always want to use the equalized triangles first. Never divide first.
And the way that that equalize triangles button works is it looks for pairs of triangles. It, it, it looks at the order of the triangles in the in the uh, geometry file and tries to figure out where are these long skinny pairs of triangles that can be subdivided. So then I use my equalize triangles and now I can click the divide button once or twice. And the divide button all it does is take each triangle and divide it into four smaller triangles. So if I wanted I could subdivide this even smaller. As soon as I find that sweet spot where we subdivide again. Because what this does is it looks at the triangle and says, well, if the average side side length is already less than 60, it doesn't subdivide it again. So you basically can decrease this value a little bit at a time until you get it to subdivide. So clearly we missed a few triangles that must just barely be on the tipping point of this 55. So if I was to go to 54, there we go. Now the rest of them divided again properly. That's looking like a really nice meshed surface. So now back to our receiving belt again. So I meshed up this entire belt. If I wanted to go back and say 75, make it a little bit smaller. I meshed up this entire length of the belt. But what do we know about this belt? We know that the particles, they're going to be sliding into this little load chute and then onto the belt. And the only part of the belt that's going to have significant wear is right in this area. Everything else down here, the particles are going to be relatively sitting still, not impacting the belt, not sh shifting around too much, but I've still divided up this whole length of belt. Is that really necessary? Maybe I could take and, and just divide this into two separate belts and say, well, let's just record the, f the, the wear and the force on this half of the belt and then ignore this other half, because that reduces the number of triangles in the file. It reduces the file size. It reduces the computation time. So whether or not it's worth your time to go ahead and just cut this into two belts is up to you. But generally all you need to do is go into your CAD file and you know take your take your three long triangles and just cut them in half or redraw them as two different layers. It's pretty simple to do. So let's go ahead and I've already done that in a different file here, two belt. So now if I go to solid, you can see I've got two different faces, two different surfaces here, two different layers rather, to represent that belt. Let's delete our shoot. So now if I go back here, I can simply say, well, let's, let's just go to my receive belt 1, that orange one, that's underneath that loading point. Go ahead and equalize my triangles and divide. And when you're using this on your belt, when you're using the equalize triangles button, sometimes you might find that it, it doesn't work properly. It, it won't properly find these triangles and subdivide them. And what that means is that the order of the triangles in your CAD file is just not correct. So in order to fix it, it's pretty simple. You just go back into your CAD file and redraw a new face over this one. Delete the old one. Redraw a new face here. Redraw a new face here. So you've got six new triangles. And then when you come back in here, it should work just fine. You hit your equalize and you can divide. Of course, I didn't want to do it with the extension. We only wanted to equalize and subdivide here. Now checking my normal vectors. My normal vectors are all pointing properly inward and upward. And we could go back to our deflector again. So I'll show you what happens. What happens if you try to divide the triangles first and then equalize them? So if we divide them, oh, we're on the wrong one. We want deflector. If I divide them, you see it divided them all properly, but there's still all of these long skinny triangles that we don't really want. And then if I try and and, and that also would mess up, it could mess up the order of the triangle. So now if I say to equalize, well, now it's not working right. It's trying to find these proper, these proper triangles, but it, it, it just, it can't do it right because we've, we've changed the order by doing our subdivision. So if I divide again and try and equalize, see, now there I found some more, and maybe divide again and equalize. And, and now what you end up with is this really goofy, ugly pattern that you don't want to have. Looking at the wear data for that would just be chaotic. So that's why you always want to equalize first and then subdivide. So maybe I want to do it with the sides as well, deflector sides. You can see I could try to equalize these, but they're actually pretty well equalized. 
and sometimes uh, if your triangles are pretty you know pretty evenly sized the equalize button could maybe do more harm than good see what it did there is it took this one and it decided to split this one into smaller triangles same thing on this side so it didn't really help us much but if I would divide we can see what it would do to the other triangle see the other triangles divide pretty nicely obviously we want to go a little bit smaller than 75 Oop, 70 65 there's still a few triangles here 62 60 and that looks not too bad we could maybe go a little bit smaller but if I, if I keep going smaller then some of these other triangles that subdivided earlier they might subdivide again like that so I'm, try I'm just trying to get these couple ones to divide but I'm ending up dividing some of these even more and making them even smaller so at some point you have to say well you know what it's good enough uh, I have a few triangles here that didn't subdivide all the way but I don't want to make this keep making this entire thing smaller just to get those three triangles so I'll call it good and of course I would re-import this geometry and subdivide that properly and I would not subdivide that so let's see uh, what this looks like I'm gonna show you a quick animation that just shows what the in what the motion of this uh, of this playback file what the motion of this file was supposed to be So just a quick simulation where we're discharging material to the receiving belt and then this rot this hood rotates over uh, over 10 seconds from 15 to 25 to divert the flow to this bypass chute. So if I go into the resulting file, I already ran that simulation. As soon as it loads here in a moment. All right. So I can skip through this and look at the flow path. Let's go ahead and change my surfaces to outer lines only. That really cleans it up so that we're not looking at all those tiny triangles. You know, I don't even I don't want to be looking in wireframe mode. I only want to see the outer lines. And you know what? We're even going to go ahead and just hide the deflector bar. I don't want to see that bar up there either. And we're going to hide all of the chute. Turn that off. So now what am I looking at? Ah, didn't mean to do that. When I click surfaces solid, it changes all the surfaces to solid, even though I had hidden some of them. That's the entire point of that right-click menu, is to quickly change all of the surfaces for you. All right, now we'll just leave it like this. So first, why don't we just take a peek at the wear on that hood? So in the in subsequent tutorials in the post processing tutorials I cover how you change all the settings to view the wear data so this whole menu is going to be covered this menu and this menu is covered in a in a later tutorial in the post processing tutorials but for now all I need to know is well deflector change that to work so you can see it starts off as blue so that's saying that my my triangle impact wear or my triangle abrasive wear it's on a scale from 0 to 1 for now you can set that scale right here but if I just say well I wanna look at the wear from say let's say 5 to 7 seconds and I click generate and what I'm actually seeing is that hey the material doesn't even hit the hood yet so I can look at the wear but it's not gonna show me anything obviously alright let's stop that Let's go. we started this moving at 15 right no, we started moving at 10, I guess. 11, 12, 13. Okay, 13. Let's say look at the wear data from, say, 13 to 15. Go ahead and generate. And you can see it's creating a wear pattern as the simulation is running. And I can see my abrasive wear. The maximum of the scale is changing. All we need to do to stop that is set our own max. So we'll set the max at, say, 3. Oh, wrong one. 3. Or 2. Oh, maybe 2.5. And that shows you the wear data. We can create animations using this wear data, or we can just use this wear data visually. We can create these wear summaries and see, well, based on this, it looks like you know my total, my my maximum wear values are somewhere in the range of three. And if I just keep running the simulation as the hood rotates, the wear is going to creep upward. And what we're probably going to see here is that as the wear creeps upward, we're going to be you know 
distributing this wear across more of the hood. So this is going to change from being red. It's going to start to decrease in color. You can already see there's there's less red there because now we're dividing up all that work of changing the direction of the particles. We're dividing that up over the entire hood surface. So certainly looking at this you can say well the the initial st the initial rotation of the hood when we first start rotating that's going to cause a lot of wear at the bottom. So maybe we want to rotate this as fast as possible or or some other method that we can use to to say well let's let's try and limit the wear at the bottom okay all right well enough of the hood let's turn off the hood now let's look at the wear on the receiving belt so if you recall we talked about meshing up only this belt so if I go back to a wireframe this one is the only one that's meshed, not that one. Okay. Actually, yep, let's go and say receive belt one work. Now we're looking at the work here. So let's go to no, well, we can just go right to five seconds. Because there's already material at the belt on the belt at five seconds. Hide those particles. And let's generate a where's not from thirteen to fifteen, from five to seven. We can see, well, we can't really see a whole lot here, can we? And that's because our, our, our scale is stuck at what, what we were looking at before, so it's not automatically adjusting itself. If I set that back to zero, it automatically found here your maximum was, was 92, or 0.92. So, but we, we want to show a little bit more data than that, so we'll turn that down, say 0 0.6, no, 0.5. Now we can see a nice profile on this belt. If we go ahead and play, we can see it progress even more. And you'll note the, the heaviest wear is obviously right at the center of the bottom of the belt. And when, uh, like I said before, we can go ahead and create animations showing this wear data. We can show wear data on the hood, then we can show wear data on the belt. We could show them at the same time if we wanted to. A ton of different things you can do. And the animation, creating animations, are also covered in the post processing tutorials. So, enough of that. Let's go ahead and look at those triangle forces change this to force. Let's do the same thing. If I now go to my triangle forces tab, let's look at the parallel forces first. Now let's say forces from, say, no, let's go 10 to 12. So what do we see here? Our scale is fluctuating. Let's go ahead and force it to, say, 0 0.5. And let's also turn, turn up our filter so that we're holding those values a little bit more steady. 0 0.4, 0.3, maybe 0.2. Okay. So now as I was talking about, what we see here is the the velocity vector points upward and the normal vector for these belts points points into the camera. So if I cross up and into the camera, my right hand, my thumb points to the right. Oh, sorry, that's for perpendicular. We're talking about parallel. Parallel forces are simple. Your velocity vector is upward, so your forces point against the vector. Clearly, there's a, there's a few forces here, a few transient forces that are pushing along the belt. But now you can see, if we look at what's going on here, the hood is rotating. And this, this is getting more and more blue, and I'll show you why that is. If I go back and say particles visible, Let's go back to let's go back to eight seconds. So the material has as fast a velocity as it possibly can get because it's not touching the hood yet. But as soon as this hood starts moving, so now that hood starts moving and it's going to start impacting that material and slowing it down, All right? So now it's slowing down this material. You can see that the material velocity now, it's much, much lower. So the lower this velocity is right here, the more this belt has to work to accelerate that material up to its belt velocity of, I want to say, 3.3 seconds. And that's why if I go back to if I go back to 10, and we play this, you can see here's my forces. I've got some positive and negative forces. But that's going to get more and more negative because of the slow velocity of this material. 
I can even go and say, hey, let's turn on my show total layer force. And that just adds up all these triangles. So we can see that the overall force is negative, And it's increasing as well. Well, now that there's no material, it's decreasing. But let's go back to, uh, let's go back to 11 and play. So negative 50, negative 60. As we divert this flow, as we slow the material down, that, that overall force is increasing, which we would exactly expect to see. Because the belt's working harder to accelerate. And then it decreases because now we've stopped dumping material onto the belt. So it's going to drop to zero. So how about the perpendicular forces? Well, even just, just looking at this, if I go back to, say, 11, I mean, looking at this, you can see it's the flow is really symmetrical. So I would not expect to see any significant perpendicular forces because the, the forces that are acting to push the belt this way are going to be matching the forces this way. So when you have a goofy shaped transfer chute that's got you know some kind of snake-like pattern and discharges sideways onto the belt, that's when you want to be using that perpendicular force and trying to look at those magnitudes and determining whether are we going to have a centering issue or belt tracking problems. So if I go here and say perpendicular, and a maximum, let's set the maximum at the same, 0 0.2. So let's go back at 5 seconds before that hood starts rotating. So we're looking at an under a, a bottom view. Let's switch to a proper proper bottom view is what we're looking at here. And of course, that's the other advantage of making sure that your layers only have uh, don't have a thickness, making sure that your your belt is only composed of a single triangle. There's not a top and a bottom face. Then when I look at a bottom view of this belt, I can see exactly what was what is on the top, and I still have the benefit of watching that material flow over it. So with this bottom view, you can see lots of blue on one side, lots of red on the other. And then there's uh, it's kind of swapped in the middle, and I'll explain that too. But overall, our total air force, oh, plus or minus 10 newtons. It's shifting hovering right around zero pretty much. That's what we expected. Let's switch to a top view. And let's go ahead and hide those particles. So as I as I was explaining before when I was talking about the parallel forces, if we if we determine what's the positive direction, is that left or right? So if I wanted I could even say, well let's turn on my triangle normal vectors. We can confirm that yep those vectors are indeed pointing inward and upward toward the top of the belt. Turn those off. So the velocity vector points upward, and the normal vector points into the camera. So if I cross the, that upward vector with the camera vector, A cross B, my thumb points to the right, following the right-hand rule. Therefore, positive forces are pointing to the right, and negative forces to the left. So all you have to remember is, if you go to a top view of your belt, if you're on a top view looking down, and your belt is moving upward, that's the velocity vector. Your normal force, your positive force, always points to the right. And your negative force will always point to the left if you have your camera view positioned like this. So now looking at this, we see, well, lots of positive force right here. And why is that? Well, we've got material that's piled up there. And that material is trying to slide down toward the center of the belt. But the friction against the belt is preventing that from sliding down. And the exact opposite is true on this side. The material wants to slide inward, but the wants to slide inward along the face of the belt, but the friction with the belt is preventing it from doing that. So that results in that force. And now in the middle, we see that it's kind of opposite. At least right in this section. And that's just an effect of the material converging here. Go back to 5 and play that. So overall, the net force on this is 0. But certainly, if my hood was misaligned, 
or if this uh, load chute was misaligned and pointing slightly to the left, we would absolutely see a, a difference in these in this total air force. It would it would be non-zero, and there would be a a strong effect one way or the other. So that pretty much covers prepping your surfaces for uh, the simulation. We we talked a little bit about how to actually view those forces, but. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the uh, post-processing tutorials will cover that a little bit more. So just remember, if you have rotation, mesh up your rotation surfaces. And when you want to do that, um, the layer force and the layer work, check your normal vectors, and then mesh up your surfaces. Just like that. And it's not necessary to go any smaller than you know at the at the very minimum 50 millimeter 50 millimeters is probably fine you know setting this to 50 you don't ever need to go smaller than that but usually 100 will even get the job done depending on the size of that particle set so i think that covers everything and if you have any other questions there's a lot of good information in the manual the manual talks a uh, very specifically about analyzing your work and your forces and it shows pictures from uh, a similar pictures from a similar simula simulation talking about your normal vector your direction of your forces and all of that and also if I go back to that playback file when it opens in a moment looking in here there's a good wealth of information in both of these little help bubbles on the triangle forces and on the work and it'll explain pretty much the same information so if you have any other questions that you can't find those answers to go ahead and send us an email uh, at info at thanks